My name is Judy Peterson, and I'm the president and CEO of the Chittenden and Grand Isle VNA. I would really like to welcome you folks here tonight. I think you have a really wonderful evening in store. Um, I know I'm really looking forward to it. The VNA is your home help and hospice not for profit organization. The VNA has a huge menu of services, really from birth to end of life. I'm very proud to be working with this organization. And I'm just so thrilled to have all of you here to participate with us. MDI, the Madison Dean Initiative, is our educational arm for end-of-life services. Madison Dean was founded by two very special people, Joan Madison and Estelle Dean. If you would, would you s stand for a moment, both of you? And what was their brainchild, their, uh, their excitement, their really uh, wonderful, caring emotions about wanting to let people know about end-of-life care, it was their initiative that formed the Madison, <laughs> their initiative formed the Madison Dean Initiative. Um, and there's now a committee that works with them. And they do a lot of community education and many other projects. It's a committee that I, I've only been able to attend twice so far. But what a terrific group of people. They've worked very hard to put this event together tonight, and I'd like everybody to give them a big hand. <laughs> I'm now going to uh, pass the microphone on to Jerry, who will introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Judy. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jerry Amori, and I am a volunteer with the Madison Dean Initiative. I have the pleasure tonight of introducing Jane Brody. Jane E. Brody is the personal health columnist for the New York Times. She joined the Times as a specialist in medicine and biology in 1965 after completing degrees in biochemistry and science writing at the New York State College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Cornell University and the University of Wisconsin School of Journalism, respectively, and a two-year stint as a reporter for the Minneapolis Tribune. Her award-winning column is published every Tuesday in the Times, Science Times section, and in many other newspapers across the country. Ms. Brody is a trusted authority on health and who lectures frequently to both lay and professional audiences on all issues relating to health and wellness, including end-of-life preparation. Her latest book, Jane Brody's Guide to the Great Beyond, a practical primer to help you and your loved one prepare medically, legally, and emotionally for the end of life, is a roadmap to putting your affairs in order or helping your loved ones do the same. Ms. Brody is the only or principal author of more than a dozen books, including two bestsellers, Jane Brody's Nutrition Book and Jane Brody's Good Food Book. She has appeared on hundreds of radio and television programs and starred in her own 10-part show on public television, Good Health from Jane Brody's Kitchen. She has written scores of magazine articles and won many prestigious journalistic awards for excellence. She is the mother of twin boys and the grandmother of four boys, including a set of twins. <laughs> Brooklyn born and bred, she lives in New York City. Jane is often heard to say there is no cure for mortality. No matter what your age or the age of your loved ones, the time to start to prepare is now. At the end of tonight's program, there is a book purchase sponsored by Phoenix Books and a book signing. So please feel free after the program to buy your book and take them over to Jane to be signed. And now, it is my distinct privilege and honor to present to you Ms. Jane Brody. I first want to make sure that you can all hear me at the back of the room. Yes? You cannot? Okay, we, we're going to do a little adjusting here with this. Can you hear me better now? No. All right, so what's the problem, guys? <laughs> you put 
it up higher. It is on. No? What do you think? I'm pressing that one. Hello? Hello, hello. You're live. It's live. You can't hear her? It's all the way up to my neck already. <laughs> Let's see. No, it's gonna, it'll, it'll flunk. Is this any better? Yes? Not, they can't hear me in the back. One more thing. All right, just a minute. I'm getting dressed. Or redressed, I should say. You got it? Try that. How's that? Is that any Is better? Is that any better? Okay, good. Excellent. Now all I have to do is be able to see, and we're in business. <laughs> now, you know, no matter how healthfully you live, and no matter how well you eat, how much you exercise, or how many supplements you may take, there is no cure for mortality. Sooner or later, all life draws to a close, whether you like it or not. Now, far too many people place far too much faith in the so-called miracles of modern medicine. <coughs> and unfortunately, too often these miracles, in quotes, make the last months, weeks, days of life unnecessarily painful for the people who are dying and for the people who love them. Now, even if you are currently young and healthy, the better prepared you are to cope with end-of-life issues, the less physically and emotionally traumatic the end can be for you and for the people that care the most about you. Now, there are a few preliminaries in order for this talk. This will not be a talk about mysticism, despite the title of my book. <laughs> Those of you who may know my work in the New York Times as a personal health columnist no doubt know me as a very practical, down-to-earth person. Rather, what you're about to hear is loosely based on my book, Jane Brody's Guide to the Great Beyond. And in the course of this talk, you will be treated to about two dozen cartoons. That's to make this subject a little more tasteful for people. The source of these cartoons is a book called Last Laughs by a New Yorker cartoonist named Mort Gerberg. He enlisted his uh, New Yorker pals to produce cartoons that were relevant to the end of life. Now, before I say another word, I want to make sure that we are all on the same page. How many of you expect to live forever? <laughs> because if you do, you can just leave right now. This talk is not for you. I will read out the caption so everybody can hear this. Before I go over your test results, can we agree no one lives forever? <laughs> now, whether you choose or not to think about, about it, death is an inevitable consequence of life. And like love and marriage, at least in the song, you can't have one without the other. Oh, it's not going. There we go. Actually, I preferred heaven too, but then the marketing guys got a hold of it. Now, many of you may have already had experiences with physicians at the end of life. Physicians, unfortunately, are among the staunchest of death deniers. Now, this is very understandable. After all, physicians are trained to preserve life. They're not trained to assist death. But the time, I say, is overdue for physicians to speak up, not just for life, but for the quality of life. Now, there was an excellent article written way back in May 08 in the New York Times. It was called, For the Elderly, Being Heard at Life's End. And it talked about the concept and practice of slow medicine, the idea that there comes a time at which it's ridiculous, pointless, to continue to provide aggressive care as a person nears the end of life. It pointed out that treatment of the elderly uh, at acute care hospitals can often be inhumane, 
and that once a patient and family are drawn into the system, it can be very, very hard to pull back from it because our medical and our social culture has a built-in bias. And that bias is that everything that can be done, should be done, and will be done. Now, of course, most of us, if not all of us, want to live as long as possible. I do. But we don't want, just want to live long. We want to live long and well. The Times article quoted a former administrator of Medicare who said, personal control, quality of life, and the opportunity to make good decisions is just not automatic in our system. A special residence for the elderly in New Hampshire encourages their residents to talk about how they want to spend their last days. And a nurse there said that when making decisions about various options for medical care, quote, you need to understand what you face, what you most want to avoid, and what you most want to happen, unquote. Now, I'll hazard a guess that most of you would not want to spend your last days, weeks, months, years being kept alive, so to speak, by a panoply of machines. Grandpa's secret of longevity is life support. <laughs> I'll also hazard a guess that most of you would not want to share the fate of folks like Terry Schiavo. Who remembers Terry Schiavo? Oh, good. She lived, so to speak, I don't really call this living, for 15 years in a persistent vegetative state, kept alive by a feeding tube. Now, avoiding a fate like Terry Schiavo experienced requires planning and preparation, especially planning for the time when you may be unable, as she was, to speak for yourself. Now, one couple in Texas named Douglas and Aaron Cramp called it Living with the End in Mind, and they wrote a very helpful little book with that title during the melancholy time when Aaron Cramp was battling metastatic breast cancer. Erin made sure that all her ducks were in a row, well in advance of her demise, complete with her funeral plans. And as painful as her death was for her young family, it was made much less so by her forethought and by the steps that she took to make sure that things would be easier for the loved ones she was leaving behind. Now, my late friend Jan Jeffrey also made her death less painful for her family by her advanced preparations. During the two and a half years that, as she described it, she coexisted with her disease, which was a form of cancer that destroyed her immune system, she made sure to contact all the people that she ever cared about. She made farewell visits to her closest relatives, and she spent many weeks preparing her own memorial service, specifying down to the very last detail who should do and say what. I understand old Ferguson wrote the service himself. Here's my favorite. I'd like to be buried in this outfit if I can lose 10 pounds. And some of you may empathize with this one. The poor dear wanted to give his own eulogy, but I'm doing the rebuttal. <laughs> now, if I may return to more serious matters, when it became apparent to my friend Jan that treatment for her cancer was no longer helping her, she announced that the time had come to go into hospice, where she could be kept as comfortable and as spiritually buoyed as possible where her nearest and dearest, including her darling two-year-old granddaughter, could visit whenever they wanted. Now, you don't have to have been a Boy Scout to know the value of that organization's motto. You know what it is, right? Be prepared, like these young folks. Jason and I want to talk to you guys about assisted living. <laughs> A 
And, and preparations should start early, as early as possible, because folks, let's face facts, you never know. You never know when your time will come. You can be hale and hearty one day and be diagnosed with a fatal illness the next. You could step off the curb and be hit by a car. You could fall off a ladder and end up in an irreversible coma, which is in fact what happened to an aunt of mine who fell off a ladder in her early 40s on the one year anniversary of her husband's sudden death from a heart attack. So you just never know. Like, uncertainty, Sylvia, is life's big draw. Now, Terry Shivo was only 26 years old when she suffered that heart attack that left her brain so starved of oxygen for so long that she was incapable of ever resuming a meaningful existence. Now, if Mrs. Shivo had had the foresight at that young age to record her wishes in the event that one day she might be unable to speak for herself, her husband would not have been locked in a decade-long court battle to pull the plug that kept her technically alive long after it became medically obvious that she could not recover. Okay, whose turn is it today to try and wrestle that plug away from Uncle Jim? <laughs> now, planning and preparation for the end of life is not a morbid task, and it's especially easy to do when you are well and you're not in any immediate danger of being otherwise. My husband and I learned this lesson as one by one our parents died or developed irreversible fatal illnesses. My mother-in-law, for example, had been treated for ovarian cancer four years before Minnesota passed one of the very first so-called living will laws in the country. Now, although she seemed well at the time, she wasted no time in writing out a, will, a living will for herself. And that very summer, her cancer returned. And when she began hemorrhaging and was taken by ambulance to the local hospital, she had the presence of mind to take along her living will. And upon admission to the hospital, she announced to the medical staff that she was to receive no treatment for her condition. Now, fortunately, she, this was an enlightened community hospital. And I should say, my mother-in-law was a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> and at her request, a do not resuscitate notice was posted on her hospital door. Her relatives and her minister were notified and rushed to her bedside. Twelve hours later, after many meaningful goodbyes, she died in peace and comfort. Her minister remarked afterward that it was the most peaceful death he'd ever witnessed. Now, soon thereafter, my husband and I completed these advanced directives of our own. Neither of us wishes to have our lives maintained by machines when there is no hope for recovery to a meaningful existence. And I don't want my hard-earned money squandered on futile treatments. Just keep me comfortable, give me enough time to kiss my children and grandchildren goodbye, and let me go. But of course, such directives can come in any size and shape that you may choose. I want my living will to stipulate that I spend my last hours sipping a pina colada on Maui. <laughs> now, furthermore, whoops, get rid of that. Furthermore, as some of you may already know, the so-called living will is not enough. It's merely a guide. It's not a guarantee that when push comes to shove, your wishes will be followed. In my state, it's not even of New York, it's not even a legal document. I'm not sure what it is here. Um, it may not be available when it's needed. The doctors who care for you or your loved one may be too afraid of liability to listen to what it says. But most important, it is virtually impossible for any document that you record in advance to cover every sort of medical contingency that could arise, including this one. Could you give me another hour, pal? I just took a Viagra. <laughs> That's really, 
that really speaks to modern times, right? <coughs> but what can be adapted to particular situations and is legal in nearly every state is a health care proxy. The assignment of a person, preferably two people, who can make medical decisions for you when you can't make them for yourself. And that is part and parcel of what an advanced directive should be. And in fact, if you are hospitalized for any reason in most states, the hospital is going to ask you whether you've completed the assignment of a health care proxy. And if not, probably hand you a form and ask you to do so right away so that it can be part of your in-hospital medical record. Now, your health care proxy is not something you just say, tap your neighbor on the shoulder and will you do this for me? They should, that person should discuss with you the conditions under which you would and would not want various types of therapies. These do not have to be written down in great detail, though it is a very good idea for your health care agent to have a copy of your completed advanced directive. And on the back of the room, uh, is it outside the room? I guess there are brochures that have been distributed by the D uh, Madison Dean Initiative that include a wonderful, um, let's see if I can put my hands on it so I can show you. No, I can't, but it's here. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful brochure that, that lists the kinds of questions that you should be discussing. It's just, this, it's, it's in this piece of paper somewhere. I'll find it before, the, oh, here it is. It's Summary of Madison Dean Key Activities. No, nope, that's not it either. <laughs> it's, it's there. It's there. It's start the conversation. It's the in the start the conversation bigger brochure. I, I wonder what I did with it. Anyway, it's here. But that's critically important to go through those kinds of questions because these are things people just don't think of. You know, what kind of conditions would you want or not want to be kept alive? Now, you can choose as your health care proxy anyone you trust. It could be your spouse, if you trust your spouse, <laughs> or significant other. You know, if you think your spouse is, your spouse is trying to get rid of you fast, <laughs> that might not be the one you want. <laughs> also, you may not want somebody who wants to keep you around as long as humanly possible, regardless of the condition you're in. It can be an adult child or a sibling. It can be a good friend. But whomever you choose, it should be someone who is likely to be readily available to medical personnel should the need arise. Thus, your lawyer or your local congressman or a child who lives in another country may not be the best choice. Also not the best choice is someone who is a wimp. <laughs> that the person you choose has to be willing to stand up for what they know you would want under the circumstances. And that person has to be willing to say to the doctor, no, he or she would not want a feeding tube when you've got stage four cancer. Or, yes, they would. But regardless of what the doctor is telling you, that you have to be able and willing to express the wishes of the person you represent. That doesn't mean your wishes. That means the person's wishes that you represent. Incidentally, in your advance directive, you can help support life by specifying your desire to donate usable organs to someone whose life may depend on the legacy that you bestow. Not much in the way of hard assets, I'm afraid, but he did leave some highly desirable organs. <laughs> and in your advance directive, you can name which organs you're willing to donate. After all, you just may want to keep some of them for possible use yourself. <laughs> like seeing your relatives in heaven. Mom, Dad. You've gotten back together. <laughs> <laughs> Some take, sometimes it takes a very dramatic incident to do <laughs> that. This, is, this reminds me of my, my high school boyfriend. Gracious me, I certainly never expected to run into you up here. 
Or perhaps you'd want to donate your body to a medical school, <coughs> which is what my husband did. Medical schools need a constant supply of bodies on which students can learn, and body donations are best arranged in advance while you are alive. So if this is something that interests you, don't delay in making the needed contacts with your local me medical center. And also make sure that your next of kin, whoever the ne legal next of kin may be, agrees with that decision. Because once you're dead, you do not own your body. You do not. Your next of kin owns your body. And if that person doesn't agree with what you decided to do, then it's tough luck. Now, both of my sons have chosen this route because penny pinchers that they are, they found out that it's the cheapest way to die. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? I'm not kidding. <laughs> they, they really see no point in having people spend money on them after they're dead. Now, the medical school takes care of everything, from picking up the body and embalming it, and they will even have the remains cremated and properly disposed of or returned to the next of kin when the students are through studying the body. Now, while you may not have yet made any preparations for the end of life, you can't tell me that you've never thought about the possibility that one day your life will end. I know you have because the best read part of the newspaper for which I work <laughs> is the obituary page, <laughs> including the paid obituaries in their little tiny print, which some of you probably have to read with a magnifying glass. Now, <laughs> this Ro Roz Chast, who did this cartoon, is my favorite cartoonist. She is just an absolutely delicious human being. She, she used to live in Brooklyn, right in my neighborhood, and um, she grew up in Brooklyn, but she now lives in Riverside, Connecticut, or something like that. Anyway, uh, she still writes for The New Yorker, and this, I have to tell you, if you can't read the, what it says in the newspaper, it says, two years younger than you, 12 years older than you, exactly your age. <laughs> I have to admit that when Nora Ephron died, I was totally freaked because Nora Ephron was my birth mate. We were born on exactly the same day, May 19, 1941, and I really felt like I'd lost a piece of myself when she died. I mean, an incredible talent um, <coughs> who suffered a lot of <coughs> difficult times and came through always shining like a rose, or whatever you shine like. Um, <laughs> And here's another one. His favorite movie was Shane, which he sat through 27 times. This obituary is really thorough. <laughs> <laughs> now, there are some other things that you can do while you're still well and very much among the living. Most, if not all of you, have prepared a, a written last will and testament, designating how to your remaining assets, your money, possessions, property, should be divvied up among, uh, upon your d death, and if you're the parent of minor children, who should be their guardians? Now, my mother-in-law, again, hoping to forestall family battles after she died, she's a very smart woman, she was, labeled all of her household treasures as to who should receive them. I mean, there were little pieces of paper behind each thing, and it was, um, it was amazing, because the tactic worked extremely well. There were no arguments, no hard feelings among her survivors. Nobody in the family dared to challenge this self-determined woman even after she was dead. <laughs> now, but have you ever thought of certain less tangible assets that could be even more valuable than money to some of your heirs? And I'm talking now about life legacies, memories, life lessons, words of wisdom, even recipes, things that can live on long after the money and other tangible items are gone. Now, after my father-in-law died, my mother-in-law, who had no more than an eighth grade education and never learned to type, 
decided to write the history of her community, which happened to have been the first Swedish settlement in Minnesota. And her book, which was called Scandia Then and Now, which my husband dutifully edited and typed for publication, because he was the only one who could read her handwriting, <laughs> remained a popular item in her community for many years after she died. Now, following in her mother's footsteps, my sister-in-law has spent the last two decades writing out lengthy vignettes from her childhood growing up in rural Minnesota. And it's a history that would be lost when her generation dies out, but now can be preserved for her children, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, even her great-great-grandchildren. Now, also, you might want to think about what you don't want to leave behind <laughs> as a legacy after you're gone like this person. I should have made that sex tape. <laughs> or this guy, Maynard, your deathbed confessions were disgusting. Do you hear me? Disgusting. <laughs> now, there's another legacy that can be potentially invaluable to your heirs, and that is the results of an autopsy. Now, any time you see a new physician, you're likely to be asked to complete a medical history questionnaire that includes questions about family diseases and the ages and causes of death of members of your immediate family. Now, if you happen to have been adopted, you might not have access to this information. But for the rest of us, knowing what our genetics may predispose us to can sometimes make a life and death difference. Now, when the journalist David Bloom died suddenly while on assignment in Iraq, not from a gunshot, not from a missile or a bomb, an autopsy revealed that the cause of David's death was a pulmonary embolism, a clot that lodged in his lungs. Furthermore, it, the autopsy showed that this embolism, this clot, resulted in part from the fact that unbeknownst to him and his family, he carried a genetic defect called Factor V Leiden that predisposed him to blood clots. Now, his three young daughters can be tested for this mutation, and if any of them have it, they can be advised about ways to avoid the kind of fate that befell their young father. Now, despite what you happen to see on TV crime shows, autopsies are, in more ways than one, a dying breed. <coughs> in most cases, families have to pay for them out of pocket, and few families now are willing to come up with the $2,000 or so to find out what their loved ones really died of. Newly built hospitals aren't even bothering to install autopsy rooms, and valuable medical information is now being lost routinely in graves and crematories. He's one tough cookie. I've never seen anyone bounce back from an autopsy before. 